Hi, welcome to another edition of Easy Theory. New setup, and you'll see more of that starting in the spring, but today we're going to be talking about a, the emptiness problem with context-free grammars. So we talked about the acceptance problem, now let's talk about the emptiness problem. So the emptiness problem, of course, is we are looking at descriptions or encodings of a single grammar. So G is a CFG, and the language of this grammar is empty. And what I claim is that this is decidable. So we can't use the same techniques that we used for uh, E sub DFA, where we just saw if we could reach one of the final states or not from the start state. You may think we can just convert this to a PDA and do the same thing. The difference is that the ability to apply a transition with a PDA is different depending on what's on the stack, and that is a temporal thing, which means that at, at a different point, not right now, but maybe later, I might be able to apply this transition and not now. And there is a way around that, but I want to show you a different way, the, the most taught way of doing this. So the way of doing this with is easier with context-free grammars because um, the ability to apply a rule is independent of what is happening beside the variable. So if I have some derivation and I have a variable a here, then it does not matter what's on either side of this a right here. I can apply any rule that's associated with a at all. So the way of actually approaching this is actually kind of similar to how we were able to get rid of epsilon rules in the Chomsky normal form conversion. And what we did there was we denoted a variable a as, um, as knowable if this uh, a can make in some number of rules the empty string. We're actually going to do something very similar here, but instead of being knowable, we just want to know whether a variable could ever make any string at all. And then ask the question about g start variable, whether it can make any string at all. So let's call a variable a productive if the language of uh, this variable a here, or I should actually write it this way. So um, I'm going to call s of a as a little function, which is uh, all strings uh, a could make. Okay. So that's, that's what I'm really interested in. So I'm going to call a variable a productive if, um, if this set right here uh, is non-empty. So if this set a right here, s of a, is uh, in fact non-empty. Okay. And then what we are asking here is um, e cfg is decidable if and only if there's an algorithm to determine uh, if the start variable s is productive. Okay, so then the reason for that is if we figure out if s is productive or not, then the opposite answer is the one that we give to ECFG. Why? Because if we determine that S is productive, that means it can make something, which means that the grammar's language is not empty. And if it's not productive, then the, then the language of the grammar is empty, and then therefore uh, we say accept instead of reject. All right, so how do we actually determine this? So it actually helps in this circumstance to formally define what productive means. So we say a variable, uh, let's call it x, is productive, oops, productive if one of the following two occurs. So the first one is if there exists a rule, uh, x goes to w1 up to wn, where all of the wi are terminals. Okay, so if it can make a string directly, um, then it can it can certainly it's productive certainly. And then the second one, we got to think about the inductive case. So 
what if we had a rule of the form uh, x goes to, um, uh, let's see, let's call it uh, y1, uh, z1, y2, z2, etc., y n z n and then y n plus one and why am i writing it in this fashion i'm actually doing this on the fly so the y strings here all throughout so these ones are going to be only terminals and uh, all of the z's here i'm, I'm not sleeping i promise uh, are only variables. Okay, so this this is actually um, the form of any rule at all. Um, note that this is not a single variable, um, but this is just a bunch of variables. Or or maybe we could uh, we could uh, augment this with um, these could be these are single variables. So the z's are single variables here, and the y's could be. Uh, any number of terminals. There is a way to actually formalize any rule in a grammar like that. So let's say that the z's are single variables and uh, all of the zi are productive. So this is kind of like the nullable condition. It's very similar. But here now we're saying productive and we're allowing ourselves to have terminals around here. Then I claim that x is productive too. And the reason is that if all of the zi's are productive, figure out whatever string that it could possibly make by induction. And then we got terminals in all the other places. So we got one gigantic uh, set of terminals, which means that x is productive. Okay, so, uh, so if x is either, it can make a string directly or indirectly. This is just a way of writing it indirectly. Then we call x productive. So then how do we actually determine if the start variable is productive? So what we are going to do is we're going to do some repeating. Uh, repeat. And so the first step is to mark any uh, new variables as productive if not already marked. And the way to achieve this is to scan through all the rules of the grammar. And then if we find one that is like this, this first one, then we immediately mark X as productive. And then uh, after the first pass, I guess, we will only have uh, possible ru uh, rules like this one. We're not going to have any of the first one again. Um, and then we'll mark X as productive if we find this here. So then what we will do is we'll just repeat and then answer at the end whether or not uh, the start variable, I'll call it start variable, was marked. So I claim that this runs in a finite amount of time. So this thing, this whole thing runs in a finite number of steps. You might not think that it does because this repeat right here doesn't have anything that says to stop. Um, so what we should do here is uh, I should insert something right here into right here that says um, break if none found. And that'll allow us to escape. So why does this run for a finite amount of time? Well, each time through, we're going to get one new variable at least. And so since there are a finite number of variables in total, then there are only a finite number of loops that we will do throughout this whole thing. Because there, we, we get one each time, and we'll break if we don't find any more. So we will have a finite number of iterations. And each time through, we have a finite amount of work because we only have a finite number of rules to actually check. If it was an infinite number of rules, we would uh, not be able to do this. But since it's a finite number of rules, we're able to do that. And then obviously this step runs in a finite amount of two. Um, and actually, I should, I should note here, um, answer the opposite, 
because of the discussion we had earlier. If we found that the start variable was marked, then we should say reject because we're trying to solve the empty problem. If it was marked, then the language of the grammar is not empty. And if it was not marked, then that means the language of the grammar uh, is empty. And then therefore, uh, we, can, we can say, uh, yes, we accept that the language of the grammar really is empty. Okay, so that was the emptiness for context-free grammars problem. Let me know how you like the new setup with the light here. I'm tr I may get a better camera so that it, it's not just my crappy uh, desktop camera right here and, and crappy mic. Yeah, new mic might be coming too. As always, please like and subscribe to the channel. There are many other links in the video description if you want to support the channel further. I'm doing one-on-one -on -one tutoring right now. So if you want to get in on the fun, my email is in the video description down below. You can contact me for that. And as always, please, uh, please stay safe through this winter break. And uh, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.